Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, before we get into the material, uh, some quick tips. I think hopefully everybody has gotten Stan installed by now. Um, and uh, the two recurring issues that are problematic uh, are these two. On Windows, there's this issue with getting the R tools, the tool chain installed, which gives you your C compiler. Um, and the problem aspect seems to be setting this path correctly. The path is uh, some text string stuck somewhere so that R can find where the compiler is, right? Uh, Tony, do you have some advice? Yeah, it's, it's not on here, but if you move the title path, path and stand, there's a really good tutorial that uses this other, this other. Yeah, but I don't think you don't need it. I mean, I appreciate that, but Redmond Path is just a path editor. Yeah. Just run the R tools installer with administrator rights. Right click on it and run it as administrator, and then it always sets everybody is it's working. It'll okay. it'll set it correctly. But you gotta unfortunately by default when you get to the end of the quote unquote wizard, those of you at home I'm doing this here folks. Um, I don't know why installers are called wizards on some machines, although it sounds amazing. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, there's this checkbox to set the path variable and it's unchecked by default for some crazy reason. It's not checked, so you just have to check it. And then when you, you have your administrator rights, and if that's worked for everybody, and then you haven't needed it. Yeah, you don't need the Redmond Pass thing. So far, that's worked great for everybody. Um, on OS X, uh, for, for reasons I, I don't know why, I only know how to fix it. Uh, for some of you, uh, R thinks you have G++ still, and, and keeps calling it, and you don't, because uh, all the new um, uh, Xcode installations have a way better compiler, uh, Clang, I call it, or C-Lang. Some people insist on calling it C-Lang. I, li I like the sound of Clang. But, um, so, uh, my solution is just to trick your computer uh, by creating a symbolic link, and if you execute these three lines one at a time in terminal, it'll work. And it has worked for everybody so far, right? There are a few people who can, care, who can verify that this has worked, right? This is, this is how we solve your problem, right? Yeah, so, this has worked, and this will... You, this you do have Clang on your system, uh, and this will just trick your computer every time it calls G plus plus. It's actually calling Clang, uh, and that's worked so far. Um, so these are the two things that'll get you going, and I think almost everybody has gotten stand working, right? Uh, uh, the other thing, this is minor news. Um, over the weekend, I updated my rethinking package. Um, I, I work slowly on this, kind of accumulate a number of bug fixes until I decide to publish it. Uh, none of these bug fixes are critical, but um, the two to take note of, there was this weird issue with the ensemble function. If you put in a model that had nearly zero weight, sometimes it would do something weird only if the models were entered in a certain order. Uh, bugs like this are what I die for, right? <laughs> um, but I eventually figured out a way to replicate it and figured out what it was and fixed it. Uh, and then there is this uh, thing that pops up for some people at, at some seasons of the year uh, where MAP doesn't like linear models that are just... Let's call them monadal. <laughs> uh, they're just single symbols, basically. Um, and that should work better now, too. I think I flagged all the weird cases that that, are, that, that, that could get detected correctly. Um, there are other patch notes that don't necessarily matter to you, but if you're curious about this, I, I, I code in public on GitHub uh, because I believe you know sunlight encourages rigor. And uh, this is a great way when you're doing your own coding, put stuff on GitHub because people learn from your code and you learn from other people's code. Uh, it's a good habit to get into. Um, and GitHub's very easy to start on. Uh, it's pretty easy to get going with. So that's where it all is. Uh, okay, let's get into the content this week. So last week ended with my sermon on the multiplicity, we could call it. Uh, the sermon on the multiplicity is, is how maximum entropy is the, a general framework for doing Bayesian inference, uh, more general than the Bayesian updating we started the course with. And it's just a matter of counting up all the ways different events could arise, conditional on our assumptions, and then we bet on the things that can happen more ways. And that's probability theory. It's really all it is to it. Um, and the multiplicity is the, the, the combinatoric way of counting up the formula for the combinatoric uh, uh, expression that gives you all the ways that things can happen. Uh, and Information entropy is a measure of that multiplicity. And so when we maximize the entropy of the distribution, we're betting on the thing that can happen the most ways. Uh, and that's really all logical probability theory is. Um, and I'm, I, I go through all that to say that there's nothing mystical about information entropy or entropy in general. Uh, it's just nature produces these distributions too because there are vastly, vastly more ways to produce the high entropy distributions than other things. That's why they're called high entropy. 
<laughs> that means there are lots of ways to produce them. That's really all it means. Uh, so any mystical stuff you were once polluted by being taught that entropy had to do with order and disorder and stuff like that, that's, that's wrong. Uh, or rather, it's, it's at best superstitious. Um, and really, we're just betting on the stuff that can happen the largest number of ways. It offers no guarantees. Um, and, and the intuition behind it isn't the reason we use it or justify it. We use it because the intuition nominated it and guided its development. But we continue to use these methods because they work. That's why. They're not the only methods that work. Other paradigms also work. Uh, this one, I like it uh, because it's logical. And so you can do a lot of inspection of the methods in the realm of pure thought and figure out under traditions they will work and how to improve them. And that's when you have a mathematical bent to your mind that it's not because you like that. But other, well, I hesitate to say illogical. It's not very illogical. They have alternative logic to them. Those methods and paradigms can also work, but they're harder to inspect in the realm of pure thought because they're not optimal in the small world. Uh, and the maximum entropy Bayesian approach is optimal in the small world. Conditional on your model, there's no better way to use the information to learn faster about the true process we were able to learn. Uh, and that's nice. Um, so that sermon on the multiplicity is really just about connecting information theory and AIC and those other things to what we started with at the beginning. Um, so what is this thing on your screen then? Well, this takes us further into this. Uh, we're going to continue uh, uh, now with expanding the types of models we're interested in. And one of the things that arises from getting past the linear models we've been working with for half the course now is the connection between the guts of the machine uh, the gears and, and levers and uh, springs that, that make it all turn and work, and the outcomes, the predictions it makes, um, are get more complicated in the sorts of models we're going to start learning this week. And we really need these models and we get a lot from them. So to take a historical example, because I love historical examples, uh, this is um, a tide prediction machine from an 1879 design. There were two other designs before it um, by William Thompson, who was later known as Lord Kelvin. Uh, the Thompsons were a lineage of scientists, that were the first lineage, I think, that were uh, knighted, uh, ennobled for being scientists, um, and uh, named after the Kelvin River runs by their estate. Uh, that's where it comes from. And now we have this, you know, temperature scale Kelvin named after them as well. So Kelvin did a bunch of interesting things, and one of them was make tie prediction engines, which were mechanical computers. They weren't general purpose computers, because they, they couldn't compute anything that was computable, but they could compute tides. <laughs> that's what they were for. And this was of huge economic importance, absolutely huge. So uh, there are all of these gears, and they're interlocking, and various levers and pulleys, and the whole thing is organized in a way based upon analytical mathematics such that it predicts the tides in a certain part of the world. And the connection between the outputs of the machine, though, the predictions of the level of the tide at a certain time, and all the states and positions of the gears inside is very mysterious. And you have to know a lot about the operation of the machine to make it work. So why do we care about this? You guys aren't going to make a tide prediction engine, or we're not going to make models of predicting the tides, although that'd be fun in another course. But um, generalized linear models are like these tide prediction machines in the sense that the outcome scale and the parameter scale are, are really different spaces now. Uh, it isn't like the linear models of old, the Gaussian outcome models, where the parameters have the same units as the outcome. They're basically all the same. There's this one-to-one -one mapping between changes in parameters in the linear model and changes in the mean prediction. And that's really nice to think with, right? And that's a reason that such models are so common um, and easy to fit to data. Uh, but there are lots of reasons to use models with different kinds of likelihoods. Um, and in those cases, the grinding of the gears inside doesn't tell you much about what the predictions will be on the outside. Uh, they all matter together. They all interact. All of these gears and levers and everything else down here in the bottom of this machine, they interact to produce a prediction for so you have to process them together. And reading coefficients is doom in models like this, really doom. Now, I've been telling you it's doom all along, but you haven't believed me, because right? you could do it. I said it was doom, but you were like, I'm reading this table. Screw him. <laughs> and, and that was fine. <laughs> but now you'll see that I'm not so crazy, uh, just a little bit. Um, so uh, we're going to move past what I, I jokingly call the tyranny of Gauss. Um, and the tyranny of Gauss is the tyranny of the Gaussian distribution. And the Gaussian distribution is a foundation of what used to be called parametric statistics, where parametric basically means Gaussian uh, in that usage. And in the old days, computers were, were not so, um, well, maybe they didn't exist, actually, in the old days. And so if you wanted to do uh, uh, rigorous analytical statistics, you had to use Gaussian distributions to do it, because Gaussian distributions are mathematically convenient. They add. Uh, they're additive, and, and uh, they stay Gaussian forever. And that's nice. Um, and uh, 
epistemologically, using a Gaussian distribution as a likelihood is perfectly fine as long as um, you're only interested in the mean and standard deviation of some measure. Then it's just an epistemological model, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right? So this is like the maximum entropy interpretation of the Gaussian distribution. Again. If all you're willing to say about some collection of values is their mean and variance, then the Gaussian distribution is the only is the distribution that's most consistent with that of interest. Uh, and that's fine. Um, however, if you're interested in prediction, Gaussian distributions are easy to beat quite often because often we know more about the constraints on an outcome variable than this. Um, and sometimes we throw information away uh, when we use only the Gaussian distribution instead. So I think there's this, I have a little bit of animation with a tear for Gauss there. That's like that. <laughs> Took me about 15 minutes to figure that out. So, uh, so there are two categories of, of abuse of the Gaussian distribution that, that arise here. Uh, and I should say, before I explain these two, that obviously Gauss is not responsible for this. It's like the tyranny of Gauss, but he's, you know, he would not have approved of this. Uh, he used other distributions as well. Um, uh, and these two forms of abuse arise historically from the inertia of curricula, I think. You can't really blame individuals for this. We're all swept up in the collective curriculum, how stats is taught and practiced, and what software will let us do, and what our advisors know how to use and will approve of in a qualifying exam. <laughs> right? and, uh, so the first is coercion. Coercion is transforming data so that it becomes Gaussian. Uh, I would like to encourage you not to do this. Uh, we can do better. We can work with things on the scale you actually measured it on. Uh, Almost always. And there are lots of compromises that arise from coercion. Um, the most hazardous one, uh, the one really to worry about, is when you take counts and you transform them to proportions, and then you model those as Gaussian. Never, never do this. Why? Because it throws away information. It throws away the sample size. 1 out of 2 and 10 over 20 are the same proportion. But you should have a lot more confidence in the second one is actually a half. And so this is bad news, and there, is, there are lots of fields where this is the standard thing. Zoark, oh my god. <laughs> Zoark, this is like the main way to analyze assemblages of animal bones, is to construct proportions of different specimens and then run linear regressions on them. And this throws away so much information. So please, be, I know I'm a little bit here, please never do this. I'm going to teach you this week how to do it by keeping the sample size information in. It's easy to do. Um, the other option is surrender, so that people will realize, okay, I can't really use a likely, a Gaussian likelihood here, or I should be using something else. Um, but all I've got are these are various randomization tests, or kind of permutation tests of null hypotheses, uh, things like man with the U test and Wilcoxon tests, and those sorts of Spearman rank correlations. All of those uh, uh, statistical procedures had their place in time. There was a time when that was sort of the best you could do when you gave up on so-called parametric statistics, which meant Gaussian. Um, now we should bury these things with honors and move on. I don't see why we ever need a Wilcoxon or Man with you ever again. Uh, there was a time when they made sense, but we're going to learn better things to do now, and you don't have to sacrifice um, to the null hypothesis. We can do better than that. I should also say in there is Mantel tests. Mantel tests in biology are like a plague. And some other time you guys ask me, I can justify why that's a problem. But I know I've sermonized on this to some of you before. But um, in the last week, I'll show you how to do, do uh, spatial autocorrelation models, which where it actually makes sense, unlike the Mantel tests. Mantel tests don't estimate the correlations, right? They just test it at zero. We wouldn't be looking at it. I mean, these two communities are, are similar. Uh, you don't have, we don't need to test the null hypothesis, right? But community ecology does a ton of this uh, Mantel test stuff, and I don't think it's productive. So we'll, we'll try to get past coercion and surrender. And again, I don't want to blame individuals. I want to blame history um, that the, the technological advance of statistical methods is vaster than the tenure cycle. But that's basically how it works. Uh, so we can do better now. Um, we, we're going to generalize linear models are the beginning of a whole range of different methods. They're not all generalized linear models, but this is our gateway drug um, to get free, uh, freedom from the tyranny of Gaussian likelihoods and freedom from the tyranny of randomization tests as a, as a fallback strategy. Uh, but with this comes a lot more choices and responsibilities. So we need principles. And all that maximum entropy stuff I mean the last week is to help us have a principle by which to select likelihoods. Um, there are other principles as well, but I'm gonna, we're going to review that quickly here. Um, so the, as I said, historically, there were times when computers like the, the one on the left there, that was a computer that was maybe a thousandth as powerful as your iPhone. Uh, but it took up half a room and uh, generated infinitely more heat. Right. And uh, computing has come very far since then. You were like, with a computer like that, you were happy to you know, do, do a big matrix inversion so you could fit a least squares regression or something. 
now your iPhone is vastly more powerful than computers that sent people to the moon. Uh, absolutely so. Um, and I have a friend who runs R on his iPhone, <laughs> uh, which definitely voids your warranty, I believe. <laughs> but, uh, so you can do you can do a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah, I started programming uh, when I was uh, uh, young on a on a VIC twenty, which is a computer that nobody should know <laughs> what it is anymore, but VIC twenty, and um, which had like eight K of RAM or something like that. So th this thing blows out of the water. It's really amazing. Uh, and then we have, I think, the pinnacle of technology is the Roomba, <laughs> which, no, I'm not serious. You can, there's a whole, Google hack your Roomba. You can do some amazing stuff with a Roomba. <laughs> it's a robot, it's very inexpensive, and it's got a pretty sophisticated computer in it. You can install Linux on it and get it a new brain. And do some, so hack your Roomba, it's pretty awesome. No, I'm serious, the personal robots are coming. And, and uh, I want to get some drones for data collection soon, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so... Um, I mean, the NSA shouldn't be the only ones that have drones, right? We should all, <laughs> we should all have drones. Okay, so what are generalized linear models? Our goal is still to connect a linear model to some outcome variable. We've had that goal for a while now. Um, I, I, before we move forward with this goal, I just want to remind you that it would be great if we had, we're working in an area where we had sufficient domain knowledge, we could get rid of the linear model too. The linear model, we should always be embarrassed by linear models, right? And I use them a lot too, but I just, I'm now trying to feel embarrassed every time I publish something with a linear model because mechanistically it's crazy. Right, like oh, we'll just add these things together, multiply by some coefficients. Nature, <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> um, they're great, as I say, they're unreasonably useful given how goofy they are. If you expect the uh, assumptions of them, um, but we're going to continue with this unreasonably useful uh, linear modeling strategy. Uh, the problem now is with a non-Gaussian likelihood function, uh, or let's say the Gaussian likelihood is just a special case. There's nothing. It's not even the basal case, really. It's just one of the many choices. And what I want to show you this week is it's, it's, there's this generalized principle, uh, maximum entropy principle is the way I'm going to teach it to you, that lets us choose likelihood functions that are consistent with the information we think we know about the outcome variable. And the Gaussian is just one of those special cases that arises from that. Uh, and all the others are parallel to it, symmetric to it. But the other cases are harder to think about, and that's why we do the Gaussian first. Not because it's, in any case, special or basal, uh, uh, but because it's easiest. Um, so the general strategy with a generalized linear model, so we pick an outcome distribution. I'm going to say something about this on the next slide. Uh, we model the parameters in the linear model um, using uh, uh, the parameters in the likelihood function by linking them to the linear model somehow. And this is easy in the case of the Gaussian because there's a parameter for the mean. One of the parameters of the Gaussian distribution is the mean mu. The most uh, probability distributions don't have a parameter for the mean. So we're going to have to get a bit more creative about this. Um, and I'll, I'll spend a lot of time today on that problem. Uh, and then finally, we compute the posterior. You guys are pros at this now because you have sand on your computers, right? So you can, you can fit things uh, quite well. And this will not be that big of an obstacle. But the, what's going to arise now is um, posterior distributions can be highly non-Gaussian now, uh, even in cases where all your priors are Gaussian. Uh, you can get posterior distributions which are substantively non-Gaussian. And it's because of the tide machine phenomenon. There's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the position of any particular gear and the prediction of the tide. And it's, there's a non-linear transformation that goes on between the two. And so I'm going to show you pictures about what happens in these cases so we can get you to understand it. Uh, but that's an, that it manifests itself in um, routinely non-Gaussian posterior distributions. And that's okay. It just means this is why we need MCMC uh, in general to make things work. Okay, what do we get out of all this bother? We can model multivariate relationships with nonlinear responses, and hey, nature is nonlinear. Uh, once something's dead, it can't get more dead. Dead is an outcome, right? And so you poison a dead animal, it doesn't die again, right? So it's not an additive model. Uh, and that's how things are. I know it's like a silly example, but uh, absolutely true. Once there's enough of a toxin to kill all the frogs in a pond, they're dead, right? You can't kill them more. And uh, those, that's how nature works. Uh, so we want to have predictive models that can cope with those sorts of things. Um, and later on, when we get the multi-level models in a couple weeks, these generalized linear models are the building blocks of them. We kind of assemble together more complicated models from these pieces. Uh, so this is the component strategy. Um, and it'll be turtles all the way down uh, when we get uh, further along. So to remind you, step one, pick an outcome distribution. Um, the traditional likelihoods that are used in generalized linear models are all members of of a family called the exponential family of distributions. I'm going to show you some of them in a moment in a couple of slides. Um, 
the th important thing to know is that all of the all the members of this family arise from natural processes because uh, they have maximum entropy interpretations uh, for routine kinds of constraints. And there'll be a slide about that in, in uh, a couple of slides down. Um, so uh, nature makes these things because there are vastly more ways, given certain transformations, uh, uh, things that happen in the real world, vastly more ways to produce these distributions than others. Um, and just like the Gaussian in the soccer field, remember? The Gaussian distribution arises not because uh, it's the only thing that could happen, but because there are vastly more ways for that to happen than anything else. Um, so this lets us select likelihood distributions from first principles based upon our, what we assume about the outcome variable before we've seen the data. Uh, again, there'll be examples about what this means in a, in a little bit. Um, and I want to say, before I move on, uh, this, this gives you all the same choices that um, you'd get just if you read the classic textbook on generalized linear models. There, it's pretty ad hoc. Uh, they're just using intuitive selections of the different likelihood distributions, but it gives you all the same choices, uh, which is kind of interesting that intuition can uh, uh, lead to these choices, which are which are. Here, I'm justifying based upon a principle, uh, a general uh, principle of inference that also replicates Bayesian updating. Um, so the thing I want to warn you about at the bottom here, this, I have this joke uh, that I call histomancy, uh, which is also a thing that is built into old biometric curricula. Um, the idea here is you pick your likelihood or decide whether you get to use a, a Gaussian likelihood based upon testing whether your outcome variable is Gaussian. Do not do this. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that it's sort of irrelevant what the manifest variable looks like because all a linear regression actually assumes is that the errors are Gaussian, not that the whole aggregate data is. Why? Because there are a bunch of predictor variables that change the means of the individual cases. The only Gaussian part of it is the residual. Right? The residual is what's Gaussian. So those tests in the first part where people plot it up and look at the QQ plot and decide, do some uh, what I call the vodka test, the kobolgoros Smirnoff test, right? You should, only do, you should only do it when you're drunk um, to see if it's, if it's Gaussian. Uh, this is just not even in terms of what the model wants. This is not the right test. Uh, it doesn't matter because uh, there's a mixture. Uh, uh, but on the second order, it, it doesn't rely upon any kind of principle of inference about it. Uh, and actual outcomes are mixtures of a bunch of uh, individual cases generated by different values, different states that the system was in at that time. So there's no reason that the aggregation of the raw outcome variable should look like anything. You can't say anything from that. Uh, but this is a tradition which was, it was not invented in statistics, histomancy. It was something that was homegrown in biology, I think, and, and maybe psychology and spread from there. But I know some of you have been told to do this by your committees. And so now I'm giving you some counter authority that you can wave. You can wave the little flag of that for you. And say, yeah, Dr. Bakary said we should never do this because it's histomancy. <laughs> and uh, just let them squint at you and, and send them my way. But no, and again, I don't blame individuals. Uh, uh, there's, there's inertia, and scientists have other work to do than learn cutting edge statistics, right? So I, I'm very sympathetic to that. But it, it's uh, no statistician likes this method. Um, so we need principles instead. Uh, all right, just a quick reminder on the sermon on the multiplicity. Uh, this is due, the maximum entry perspective is, is due in large part uh, to Jane's, although it, it exploded into a big area of research, um, but he did the most to get it going. And we use this because uh, it gives us the distribution, family of distributions most consistent with our assumptions that imports no other information. Another way to say it is it's the distribution most conservative uh, that is consistent with the information we put in. Um, in, the, in the case of Bayesian updating, which, I, as I asserted before, is a special case of maximizing entropy, although in that context it's usually called minimum cross-entropy, what you're getting is the posterior distribution has the least divergence, and that's an information theoretic term, remember that, uh, from the prior, but while still being consistent with the data. So the posterior distribution is a distribution that has changed the least from the prior in information theoretic space after seeing the data. So it's conservative learning but it gets all the information out of the data that's relevant to the model. Um, and uh, you can recover all the Bayesian updating from this maximum entry perspective. Uh, but it also does more because you can put in moment constraints, which is what we're going to do with our outcome variables. Um, so let me give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, so uh, typically what you want to do is you think about the constraints on an outcome variable and then, or any kind of random variable, and then the maximum entropy distribution that corresponds to it. Last week I showed you a couple of examples. I kind of 
prove to you in rhetorical fashion that the Gaussian is maximum entropy for certain constraints and the binomial for others. Um, let me give you a summary of some of the, uh, remind you what we did before. Um, if all you know about a random variable is that it's a real value within some interval, then the maximum entropy distribution is uniform. If you use any other uh, distribution to represent your uncertainty about the values of that variable, you're importing some other constraint. You're assuming something else. And you should figure out what that other assumption is. Right? Um, if you, uh, if the constraints are just that it's real valued and there's a finite variance, the maximum entropy distribution turns out to be Gaussian. You don't have to know what the variance is. Uh, you just have to assert that it's finite. And then the Gaussian distribution is the thing to bet on. Um, and remember, entropy is, is what would they say, location invariant, so the mean doesn't matter. Right? If you shift the Gaussian distribution around, the entropy stays the same. Uh, that's why we're not talking about the mean. You get the mean for free, basically. It doesn't change the entropy. And uh, binary events and fixed probability, uh, that's what we ended with last week. You get the binomial distribution, which, remember, we, we derived it kind of ad hoc at the beginning of the course just by counting up. Uh, uh, marbles in our assumptions. That's still all we're doing. All maximum entropy does is count the ways things can happen according to according to our assumptions. And the largest uh, number of ways, the distribution that derives the largest number of ways is when we bet on it. It's the binomial. But it's also the one you get just by brute force combinatorics, by counting everything up. Yeah, hand. What would be an example of something where you wouldn't have finite variance? Uh, great question. So the question was, um, what would be an example of something where you don't have finite variance? Uh, a Cauchy distribution? has infinite variance. Uh, there's a whole uh, Levy family of distributions that have uh, infinite variance. And uh, what happens in those distributions is that at any moment, you could sample an extreme outlier that completely changes the mean value of the sequence so far. So they have really thick tails. It's one way to think about them. Power laws are the classic example that people work with a lot. Power law distributions um, have infinite variance. In practical real world, it's not infinite. It's just big enough that at any moment you could sample a value that overwhelms the empirical mean so far. So the mean doesn't converge to anything, and that's the consequence. So if, if the mean is convergent uh, over time, then you have finite variance. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as I said, the Cauchy is a favorite one of Bayesian statisticians because it works fine. You throw it in the model, it still works. And if you need sufficient statistics, like in frequent <laughs> statistics, then it's a disaster. Uh, and so... In the old days when baby boomer statisticians fought, over, fought the Bayesian wars, you know, <laughs> the Bayesians and the anti-Bayesians, the Cauchy distribution was this like glove that would get thrown on the ground. <laughs> right? It's like, oh yeah, I got a Cauchy distribution for you, <laughs> Let's see what you could do with that. I think it was just like infinite silliness, but it's fun to read the history because they were really nasty in the stats journals. Oh my God. Uh, maybe I'll post some stuff up for you guys sometimes. Uh, but... Uh, statisticians by age, I think, are over this for the most part, because we think of these as just little robots, right? And like, you're going to fight over a family of robots, really? It's like, no, they're all robots. Uh, anyway, but the history of statistics is actually pretty nasty. Um, it's interesting. Uh, as I mentioned to some of you before, since I'm off on this tangent, uh, in, in biology, which is the field I mainly think in, uh, the foundations are very secure. We don't argue about the foundations of things very much. We said we're arguing about applications. In statistics, everybody uses linear regression, but everyone disagrees about what it means. <laughs> right? So it's like a flip of that. You scratch any topic in statistics and talk about like basic advice, and people will argue for days about it. Uh, Andrew Gelman's blog is great like this in the, in the comment threads. Like every time he makes a post about like basic regression advice, man, that thread explodes. <laughs> but you get the foundations like instantly, and people are arguing. But if it's something like a horseshoe prior, man, nobody's like crickets. Right? <laughs> nobody's talking about it at all. Because everyone's like, yeah, I can see that being useful. <laughs> but, uh, I think that's curious. Uh, it feels really different than my work in evolutionary biology. Right? OK. Um, Final case, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this on the next slide, is the exponential, which is, as you might think, these distributions are all members of the so-called exponential family. Well, the uniform isn't, but the others are. Uh, exponential family. So the exponential is kind of a basal case. And in terms of a generative model, it is also. We can generate all the others, starting with random variables kicked out by an exponential distribution. So I want to spend some time presenting these distributions that way to give you, develop some intuition about it. When do you get an exponential? If all you want to say about the random variable is that they're non-negative reals, think of that as zero and positive values, uh, and that there is some mean, uh, then the exponential is the maximum entropy distribution. If no, any other distribution would assume extra stuff. Yeah, Cody. What is the gamma thing? That's coming. 
that's kind of a great question for me. Where was Gamma? Gamma, Gamma will make an appearance in a, in a little bit. But, but you know, I think the answer, you get gammas by adding exponentials, right? Okay, so let me tell you generatively about the exponential. For every one of these maximum entropy distributions, there's an epistemological story which has to do with constraints, and there's a generative set of generative stories which have to do with actual manipulations uh, in physical processes that will produce them. And the two are related, obviously, and it's, it's, when, you, when you get deep into this stuff like me, it's nice to learn both sides of it. Um, so think about with the Gaussian, the generative thing was the soccer field. Uh, that I gave you early on in the course. What about for an exponential? Well, let's think about a machine or an organism, like a washing machine or a squirrel, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, there are a bunch of components to these things. <laughs> the squirrel, squirrels have components. <laughs> Look at me like, <laughs> squirrels have components. <laughs> when, I was, when I did vertebrate zoology, I dissected a squirrel. I'll tell you, they definitely have components. <laughs> but uh, if any component breaks, um, the machine breaks. This is a thing about washing machines. Why often why cheap washing machines last longer than expensive washing machines. This is a fact in the consumer appliance uh, sector. Because expensive washing machines have a bunch of extra doodads. Those extra doodads break, and then the thing doesn't work anymore. Simple washing machines don't have doodads, and they can last a long time. Um, so here's a simple, idea, simple generative case that's going to give us an exponential distribution of failure times, of lifespans, uh, which is observed very commonly in machines and organisms. Uh, assume a constant chance of failure of any component on any given day of the year. And you can do this. We can run a simulation, 10,000 simulations, uh, over 10,000 washing machines or squirrels, uh, with one line of R code. Um, this is replicate, which just repeats something 10,000 times, and we're going to take the minimum, that is, the, the first day that any one component breaks, um, n equals 1 is one a machine with one component, and then the days from today to uh, the end of the year. Uh, if you increase in, if you run in at 1, you get this graph down here in the bottom left, with a one-component machine, you notice that there's, this is lifespans. The lifespans are across the whole year, because there's one component, so they're this basically means the machines or the washing machines are dying evenly across all the years because there's a uniform distribution of breakage days, right? Does it make sense? Now let's add another component. Um, or let's add two more. If you change that n equals 1 to n equals 3, you'll get this distribution instead of failure dates. It's not quite exponential yet, but you can sort of see where we're going here, right? It's breaking more because it only takes one of them to break. Uh, and then the whole thing's broken. And so it falls. And then by the time we're up to 10 components, it's almost exactly exponential. Uh, and so exponential distributions do appear all over the real world as a consequence of generative processes resembling this one all the time. Uh, and it turns out that these particular transformations, the only information they preserve about the underlying distribution is its mean, the mean failure time. And what results empirically is an exponential because there are vastly, vastly, vastly more ways in the multiplicity to get this than any other distribution of failure times. Right? It's not magic. It's just common forks. Uh, which may seem like that. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So now we have our friend the exponential. Exponential is kind of the basic case here. And from the exponential, you can use it in models as an outcome, uh, just as it's notated there. It has one parameter usually called lambda, lambda which is the rate of uh, failure. And uh, the R on the bottom of this graph, I'm showing you the density function in R, which is dx. Um, if you count events emerging from an exponential process, you end up with a binomial distribution. So certain events coming out of the process, right, like deaths. Uh, we'll go through this story again in a, in a little bit later today. Um, we've already talked a lot about the binomial. We're going to learn, uh, if not today, on Thursday, the Poisson distribution, which is a special case of the binomial. It has the same maximum entropy interpretation as the binomial, but it's a special case where um, there are a very, very large number of trials and a very, very low probability of success on any particular trial. And in that case, you only need one parameter to describe the shape of it, which simplifies the statistics a lot. And the Poisson distribution is very useful for modeling counts um, without any clear upper bound, right? Uh, and there are different ways to transform uh, into these uh, different distributions. Um, going back to the exponential, if you add exponential deviates together, you get another distribution that is constrained to the positive reals called the gamma distribution, which is also a fundamental distribution of displacements, like the exponential, <laughs> like time until an event. Gamma distributions arise, only way to think about it is when more than one thing has to break. Uh, so you've got components of a machine or organism, and if any one component of the subsystem breaks, 
uh, the whole subsystem breaks, but multiple subsystems have to break before the whole machine fails. Then you have gamma distributed latencies, and age of onset of cancer is almost perfectly gamma distributed in humans. Uh, almost certainly for this reason, right? Because a bunch of, bunch of cellular repair things have to break, and then their immune system thing has to break. If all those things break in the right way, then, then cancer can get going. Uh, but you have a bunch of defense lines, but the longer you live, the greater the chance that those things will all break. Uh, so the gamma distribution uh, arises in age of onset of cancer quite reliably. Um, is that a hand? Yeah. So what did you observe as components and they just looked at variable that was in the gamma distribution? Can you model I haven't quite understood your question, but sure. So like you just described a situation where there's lots of complicated things going on to, yeah. uh, for the cancer rate. Right? So yeah. Let's say you can observe oh, yeah, yeah. counts of cancer cells or that's right, that's right. age or all these things. If you had more, if you had the, if you had measurements on those basic subsystems, you you could bootstrap yourself up to the gamma distribution. You wouldn't need to just make it an assumption. Okay. You could get it to emerge from the data. Okay. If you're just starting with age of onset and you don't have those latent measurements. Uh, then you can use maximum entropy as an appeal, right? Empirically, at this point, it's kind of the standard uh, thing that they describe in that literature. But, um, so gamma distribu distribution and the exponential are both really common uh, for this reason. They're, they're good distributions for displacements, durations, uh, or distances, right? It's offset from some reference point in time or space. Um, and they arise a lot uh, in nature as a consequence. Uh, and then if you take a gamma distribution and you increase the mean to really large, it converges to a normal. Uh, in fact, lots of these things will converge to normal, not the exponential. But uh, binomial can also converge to normal, as can Poisson, if uh, their means are... Well, binomial has to be far from an edge. Uh, and the Poisson, if the mean is large, it'll converge to normal. Um, so the normal is almost at the end of this route, right? It's this, this, uh, it's this limiting distribution lots of things evolve towards as you add together, the, the, add together fluctuations. But these other distributions are equally as important in nature, and we need them as well. Um, okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, uh, usually what we want as practical applied statisticians is some way to map um, features of what we've measured to these likelihood functions. Uh, so let me give you kind of the, the basic key here to that. Um, if you have distances and durations, uh, the exponential and the gamma are your first go-to ideas. There may be other distributions to use. Uh, geometric is a count distribution that's also applies to distances and durations. Um, and these are uh, part of applied statistics called survival or event history analysis. Survival analysis in biology, because usually it's about survival. Uh, and then the social sciences is usually called event history analysis, because it's about events in people's lives, like divorce and marriage and stuff like that. Um, time to get hired. Uh, uh, recidivism in convicts uh, is an event history model. Right. Um, time to finish your dissertation. That's an event history model. So I did some work on that a couple years ago. <laughs> and, uh, so all these things are, are, are well modeled by uh, exponential and gamma processes. Time to tenure uh, uh, is a gamma process. Uh, pretty, pretty resembles a gamma distribution really closely, actually. Um, OK. Uh, counts, um, the Poisson, the binomial, um, we're going to talk about those and, and have in-depth examples of them this week. Um, at the end of Thursday, I'll mention the multinomial, and there's a section at the end of the chapter that presents some computational examples of it. Multinomial is a generalization of the binomial to more than two kinds of events. It's really useful as a class classifier, uh, sometimes called the maximum entropy classifier uh, for that reason. Uh, it is a very so – it's like the tide machine, though. And so when we get there, I'll say some things about that. It's, it's easy to use and hard to interpret. Um, unless you push predictions out of it, and then you can make sense out of it as usual. And then the geometric uh, distribution as well, a common and useful count distribution. We won't spend time on, but again, in the notes, there's a section and a computed example of it. Next week, we're going to do what I call monsters, uh, which are models that are kind of cobbled together from bits of GLMs to handle weird measurement scales. Which So in the social sciences, uh, there are these things called ordered categories, which people work with a lot because you get people questionnaires and say, how much do you like ice cream? Right. <laughs> they give you like one to seven. And they're like, what is that number? <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to cobble together what I call a statistical monster that models those things very effectively, um, the ordered categorical model. Uh, but that will be next week. And uh, so ranks and ordered categories are weird measures because they're transformations of more basic measures, and they lose information. Um, 
uh, and we'll also look at mixture models next week, cases where you mix together different distributions at different levels of the models. And these will be our first multi-level models, although I won't necessarily describe them that way. Um, and they're ways to get heterogeneity of process into the model. We're going to focus on zero inflated processes uh, next week, I think, because I think that's the most useful cases where there are certain outcomes, like zeros, uh, that can be produced by multiple processes, and you want to model all of them, um, right? So the, the most familiar case of this, to, to foreground this a bit, um, if you're walking transects and you're trying to count owls or something like that, uh, there could be zero owls there, or you could be bad at counting owls, <laughs> right? And uh, until you get good at finding them, you know, the zeros to be measured in error, and you got to account for that. Uh, so that creates what's called zero inflation. Yeah, David. So this says pick an outcome distribution. Are, we, are you saying there's for the same type of data, a duration data? Yeah, yeah. As a predictor, you would treat it differently than an outcome. Is that what you mean by outcomes here? Outcome is the outcome variable. It is the outcome variable. That's not yeah, okay. okay. All right. Question answered. Okay, let's get to work uh, on the second part here. Here's the new stuff. Um, I said now the relationship between the predictions of the model, the, out the scale of the outcomes, and the parameters inside the linear model is going to change with most of these other distributions. The Gaussian is easy, and let me remind you why. It's because the units on the outcome y and on the mu and the mean mu are the same. If one is centimeters, the other is centimeters. Uh, so you have a parameter on the same measurement scale as the outcome variable. This is a luxury that is about to end, <laughs> and you will never see it again until you use a Gaussian model again. Um, this is hugely convenient, uh, and it, it, it makes uh, so. This is the tide machine where there's a one-to-one -one mapping from each gear to some unique prediction, uh, unlike the real tide machine. Uh, what we deal with instead in generalized linear models, the typical case, is that we have some distribution, like say a binomial, where the outcome is a count. It's you know zero or a positive integer, um, but none of the parameters are that are the mean count. You have a parameter for the number of trials in. And you have a parameter p for the probability of success on any given trial, but there's no parameter for the mean. The mean is the product of n times p. That's the expected value. And usually we'd like to link our linear model to p, the probability of success on any given trial. So now your parameters are on some probability scale. We haven't, that's what we're going to spend time figuring out today what that scale will be. And the outcomes are counts, and so they're not the same. So that's why I put the question mark here. It isn't p sub i is something of that linear model. It has some relationship to it, and we're not sure what. It can't be equal to it because it's a probability, and the linear model is unbounded reals. It can be negative infinity, positive infinity. Uh, this graph over here is meant to show you that, that as you change a predictor x, the linear model can go below 0 or above 1, and probabilities can't do that. So what do we do instead? Well, we do what we always do in math when you have a problem like this. Uh, we just make a function. <laughs> so we, we, now we're going to say some function of p is equal to the linear model. And it's our job to figure out what that function is that is useful. And that's what we're going to do. And that function is going to be called a link function. Because it links the linear model uh, to the parameters, the, the, uh, the parameters that describe the shape of the likelihood. Um, they can strain it to the space. Okay, so how do you choose these? Uh, you can use canonical or natural links. Uh, that's the classical way to do this. Uh, what we mean is, yeah, sorry, the, from my childhood, there was this TV show on, which was a form of animal abuse called Lancelot Link, <laughs> where they dressed up chimpanzees as spies. And it was like a precursor to Archer. <laughs> but a lot cleaner, uh, but also crueler. Uh, anyway, it's on YouTube. Go ahead and look at it sometime. The intro sequence alone you know, is, is weird. Anyway, uh, so that's why it was there. <laughs> so uh, canonical or natural links are, are link functions that you get by factoring the likelihood function and all the exponential family distributions that you factor, can be factored in a standard way. Um, and then there'll be this term with the parameter in it that'll have a function nominated for you. And that's so, the so-called canonical link. We don't care about those, is what I want to say. Um, and the reason is because the canonical link is often bad often hard to work with. Uh, famously so in the case of exponential and gamma, the canonical link is the so-called inverse link, where you take the linear model and you do one over the linear model, and that gives you the mean. Um, and that doesn't constrain it to be positive still. Uh, and means need to be positive for exponentials and gamma, so it doesn't solve the problem we want to solve. Uh, so the canonical link is not actually a good principle to work with. Um, so as usual in modeling, you just make assumptions and you see if they work well. 
and you discard ones that don't work, and you uh, use your intuition to try and come up with new ones that might work, and then test those. So the most common and workhorse link functions, and we're going to focus on these and how to interpret them, is when you want to constrain a parameter to be in a 0, 1 interval, or any bounded continuous interval, actually, because you could just scale this uh, to be some different interval, you use what's called a logit link. And I'm gonna, we're going to spend almost all the rest of the time today working with logit links. Um, if you want to constrain uh, uh, some parameter to be positive real values, then the log link is the standard workhorse. And the log link works great, but it's got some drawbacks. Let me spend a little bit of time now before we get into um, a modeling example, um, introducing you to these two link functions, uh, showing you what they do to the linear model space, and then we're going to have examples where we work through them and interpret predictions and such. So. Again, uh, we use a logit link when our goal is to map some linear model to a zero one interval, like a per, like a probability in a binomial model. And so let's start uh, with the graph here shown on the left of this slide. On the horizontal, we've got some predictor x, right, just some predictor that you're going to use. And on the vertical, we've got the space that the linear model is on. And in the logit link, the units of the linear model are log odds. That's what logit means, actually. It means log odds. If you're not exactly sure what log odds are, I'll show you on the next slide uh, in, in detail. Um, and that's your model alpha plus beta x. Uh, the logit uh, uh, link maps that linear model onto the probability space by squeezing different parts of this linear model in different ways. So what I've done is I've applied um, uh, the inverse link function, which I'll also explain on the next slide, so that we go from the linear model over here. And this is the same function, but now it's in the outcome space. Right? So it's the implications of that particular linear model on the probability scale, or over here, as x changes. So when x is at very low values, here your linear model is at about minus 2, um, the probability, you can kind of follow the lines, ends up down here, which is a pretty low value. Right? I don't know what that is, 5%, 10%, something like that. 5% more like it. Um, notice that uh, uh, when the log odds are zero, there's no change, and you're at a half is your probability. Right? So that's your anchoring point. Log odds of zero means a half. Uh, and you'll see why in the next slide when I show you the log odds formula. And then as the log odds increase, you approach a probability of one, but it, you have diminishing returns. You can never quite squeeze out that last tiny bit of probability. Right? And likewise, the other direction is log odds get increasingly negative, go towards negative infinity, at negative infinity, you finally get to zero probability. And that's the log odd space. Um, so uh, in notation, you write these models this way, that the outcome y is binomially distributed with n trials. And on uh, the success of trial of uh, case i, the probability of success on case i is p sub i. And we say that the logit, or the log odds of that probability, is equal to a linear model of our choosing. And all the same stuff is legal here for linear models, interactions, everything that you did before. So what does this actually imply about the definition of P? And that's what we want to know. Uh, notice the P's there are the scale on the graph on the right, and the linear model scale is the scale on the graph on the left. And there's this squeezing that goes on, right, you can see. Um, so what is actually being implied here? Uh, Logit a pi just means the log of pi over 1 minus pi. It is literally log odds. The odds of something or the probability it happens or the probability doesn't happen. Right? Colloquially, odds often just means probability. But in Vegas, maybe, it means uh, the probability over the probability it doesn't happen. Right? So that's what odds tables in Vegas mean. And that's what it's going to mean here. So the log odds are equal to the linear model. That's what the logit transform <coughs> is. So what is this assumption saying that logit pi is equal to the linear model mean about p? Well, let's solve for p. That's how you figure out what it means. And if we solve for p, I'm confident you guys can do this. You should get out a napkin sometime later today with your cup of coffee and do a little algebra and verify yourself that uh, you <coughs> solve that expression up there for p. You'll get this expression, which is actually the logistic function, just like logistic growth in ecology. Uh, this is if, you know simple growth with a carrying capacity uh, gives you logistic growth and yeast in a petri dish, <laughs> logistic growth. And uh, uh, so that's what creates this S-curve, compression, equal compression on both ends. And what we say is that the inverse link function is logistic. If the link function is logit, then what you do is you uh, apply the logistic function to the linear model, 
And that's how you calculate the probability of the success of the problem. So that's what computationally is going on in your computer when it does this work. And it's something that you will do when you process parameter estimates from a table. The parameters are on log odds units. So you gotta plug them into the logistic function to get probabilities back out. We'll have examples of that to help solidify this. Um, you guys with me so far? This is just meant to be the introduction. You're not gonna get this until you do it, right? You get in there and do the kung fu. Uh, can't just watch Jackie Chan do the kung fu. You gotta do it yourself. Um, so, uh, I actually love working with um, logit link models because log odds, when you work with log odds for very long, you get really good at them. They become natural to you. And they're always scaled uh, in this particular way. It's nice that um, if you know the log odds, you can map them on the probability really nice. And this helps in, for example, choosing regularizing priors because you can say, like, well, you know, a, a beta coefficient uh, uh, log odds of four is pretty unlikely because that means basically that it's going to make the thing always happen. Uh, you can do calibrations like that with log odds. It's easier than, say, even Gaussian models where you have to account for the measurement scale and did I standardize the damn thing. Uh, all of that goes on. It's easier in log odds space, um, ironically. And so what do I mean? Well, log odds of a zero means a coin flip. Um, uh, then as you increase, a log odds of one is about three-fourths of the time. Right? Minus one is about, you know, the opposite, one-fourth of the time, right? And a log odds of three is 95% of the time, and a log odds of minus three is 5% of the time, right? Goes the other direction. And that's nice. So by the time you get the log odds of four, it means always, pretty much always. Uh, and a log odds of minus four is pretty much never. A log odds of five is definitely always, <laughs> and a log odds of minus five is definitely and you can think of it that way. And this is going to come up again because it's easy to push these linear models to have values like 100. Uh, and then the log odds, when you put that into a logistic, you get definitely always, pretty much forever always. Uh, and that makes flat regions in the likelihood. For large values in the linear model, the data are indeterminate about what parameter value to use. Uh, this is a classic problem with fitting these models that we're going to, we're going to look at some examples of what happens. Um, Let's look at the log link now, quickly. The log link is, is uh, having seen the previous slides, I think you'll get this uh, right away. Um, same kind of thing on the left-hand graph here is our linear model, and the scale on the vertical is just the log measurement. We've had some original measurement like meters or something, and we've uh, logged it. Um, so what the log link implies is that we've got an exponential relationship between the value of our predictor and the outcome. Uh, the mean of the outcome. Uh, and it really is exponential. Uh, why? Because the inverse of log is to exponentiate something, to raise e to that value. And it creates this exponential growth process. Um, this can be, this is very useful as long as x doesn't vary over huge ranges. If x varies over huge ranges, look, nothing's exponential forever, right? Eventually, as I, I have this joke in my game theory course where I say it's peacocks, can, tails can't keep growing or we'd have peacocks the size of Jupiter in no time, right? So at some point, you know, growth reaches a limiting point. Uh, you just can't take in energy or you collapse under your own weight or something like that. Uh, so over a really big range of whatever predictor, um, these log linear models, as they're called, uh, apply exponential forever, imply exponential growth forever. And that can't be right. So you do have to be careful um, about this. And there was this paper on uh, hurricanes that came out last year that I may make fun of later uh, where this, this problem arose. Uh, it's about... Female named hurricanes being more dangerous than male named hurricanes. You may have seen that paper. Yeah, that's a tragedy of a paper. Uh, anyway, they get this prediction. They have this exp They have a log linear model, and they make this prediction that, like, if Hurricane Andrew had been named, like, Hurricane Alice or something, like, 100,000 more people would have died or something. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> there's, there's the log link being stupid right there. Uh, just can't be right. Uh, so, but log links are, are very useful, but you do have to be careful. Like with all models, they can, they can do nonsense. So, here's just to show you, um, very, uh, we haven't been using it this way, but there's nothing wrong with it. You can attach a linear model to the standard deviation of a Gaussian distribution. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, maybe you think the variance changes in response to a certain predictor. It could happen. Lots of processes are like that. Then, you need to constrain sigma to be positive, though. So, putting a log link on it will do that. Because that implies, then, that sigma is the exponent of the linear model. Those are often very useful models. Um, and uh, internally, in Markov chains, often, if you constrain a parameter to be positive, this is what's implied, what's going on. Um, so it's, it's quite useful on parameter scales. Okay. Uh, 
Last step, compute the posterior. Um, throughout the content starting this week and to the end of the course, I'm going to alternate between using map estimation with quadratic approximation and using the Markov chains you guys are using now to show you when. Sometimes map estimation is great, uh, but in general, it's never safe for these models uh, because you've got what, are, what I'm going to introduce to you next. Um, ceiling and floor effects arise through the squeezing going from the linear model space to the outcome space squeezes different regions, uh, and that creates these, well, fun things that happen uh, for us. Um, uh, interpretation gets harder because it's like it's like the Thompson Tide machine. Um, so let me let me give you uh, attempt to give you an intuitive reason that when I say everything interacts in these models, um, all the predictors, even if in your linear model you just have main effects, in practice over some ranges of the predictor values, the predictors necessarily interact with one another, and it's because of this squeezing effect of the of the from the linear model to the outcome space. You can think of this as floor and ceiling effects. So in something like modeling a probability of survival, it can't go below zero and it can't go above one. We could have a predictor for some organism uh, that likes warm temperature uh, that's say a standardized temperature, right? And as it gets warmer towards the chili pepper, uh, its survive, probability survival gets higher, but it eventually reaches a ceiling effect where it isn't going to get any better for it, right? Until it gets so high it kills it, right? But that's not always true, right? Right? Uh, uh, eventually, it, it, you can't survive more. It's already surviving, and, it, and you get diminishing returns. It's bound to happen that way because surviving is surviving. Eventually, conditions are so good that giving you even more stuff to help you live is going to make you live more. Uh, and in the other direction as well, if we start dropping the temperature and say this is like a salamander, which is what I had in mind when I was thinking of this, and uh, uh, the temperature gets lower, uh, salamanders don't like the cold, uh, it's probably your survival starts to drop, Eventually, uh, it's dead, and you can keep making it colder and colder, and it's still dead, <laughs> right? There's this minimum temperature it can survive at, it can survive above, and that's a common thing with lots of organisms, right? Uh, there used to be lots of lab experiments like that where scientists just spent their time trying to find the environmental conditions that would kill various organisms, right? <laughs> Previous, no, their textbooks full of this stuff. Like, I always imagine the macabre lab technicians. Like, how many goldfish did you kill today? Oh, wow. 200. Yeah. They don't like acid, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> so I say just like macabre stuff of previous centuries. Anyway, um, does this make sense to you guys, how this arises? It's, it's a consequence. I mean, real data behaves this way, so you want the models to behave this way. This is not an affliction of this form of modeling. It needs to work this way in order to be useful. But it makes the parameters harder to interpret because the parameters are on a linear scale uh, and the effects are not. The consequence of that is that it induces interactions. What I mean is, an interaction is any case where the effect of changing a predictor depends upon the values of other predictors. I'll say it again. An interaction is any general case in which the effect of changing a predictor depends upon the values of other predictors. And you can explicitly put interactions in by putting in interaction terms. And you'll still want to do that with these models. But you always get interactions in some ranges if you're near a ceiling or floor. Right? The thing, if it's cold temperature, then it doesn't matter that you take the food away. The thing was going to die anyway. And so there will be no effect of starving the salamander. This is, sorry, this is horrible. I should have thought this sounded, it sounded <coughs> less cruel uh, before we started. To be on the positive end. Feeding it more when it's warm will help it survive even better. Right? However, if it's cold and you feed it, then that can make a big difference. Because right? you can get you off the floor. Uh, but the effect will be smaller than if it was in the middle range. Um, mathematically, you can think about it this way, if you prefer. With a linear regression, uh, uh, the effect of changing x is just the partial of the linear model with respect to x. And that turns out to be just the beta coefficient. And that's the classic thing about linear regressions that's so nice. And it arises because there's this one-to-one -one mapping of <coughs> the view and, and the outcome, uh, the, the average outcome. In logistic regression, here's the implied definition of p. It's the logistic of the linear model. If you take the uh, uh, partial derivative of p with respect to x, you get that thing over there, where that is beta over 2 times 1 plus the hyperbolic cosine of the linear model. The whole linear model remains inside this thing. Uh, and yeah, it doesn't matter. You don't need to know what a hyperbolic cosine is, although they're cool. <laughs> you don't need to know what they are. It's the path that a suspended uh, string makes uh, in certain physics experiments, actually. So, uh, but. Uh, the whole point is that all the parameters are still in there. And no matter how big your linear model is, it'll appear in the denominator of this thing. So it'll all the parameters always matter. All the predictors always matter uh, for the effect of one, uh, the changing one predictor on the outcome. Uh, and again, you kind of want that. Otherwise, the model wouldn't behave right on the outcome scale. Uh, but it makes interpretation a little bit more difficult. 
Um, we'll work through examples in plotting uh, of how to cope with that. Okay. All right, so here's our game plan. Uh, uh, starting today and then cruising on Thursday, we're going to work applied examples of count models, mainly binomial and Poisson examples. Next week is monsters and mixtures. Um, that'll transition us into multi-level models, and uh, we'll do varying intercepts and slopes and probably start Gaussian processes. And then week 10, we're going to do measurement error and um, missing data, which are special applications of the strategies we've gone so far, cases that I love because it blurs the lines between what's data and what's a parameter. And then in the Bayesian world, they're all the same stuff. They're just probability distributions, right? If you have partial information about a measurement, then it has a probability distribution. And it works the same way as everything else. And you can always replace a data point with a probability distribution if you're uncertain about its exact value. And Bayes theorem works exactly the same way in your in each other. Uh, we're going to do cases like that. So we can put measurement error, we can put missing data, which is the extreme case, right? A missing data point is total measurement error. Right? The measurement went so bad you don't even have it. Uh, and you would think you can't do anything in that case, but I will convince you we can. Uh, we can still do stuff, right? Because you still know things about it. You know it's a measurement of a family for which some of the other elements you didn't, you did actually measure. So you have information about the values that were missing because you have assumptions about the total distribution of that random variable. So we'll exploit that when we get there. Um, that's the road ahead. Okay, so let me take you in the remaining 20 min minutes towards um, logistic regression in our first uh, detailed work through case, and then I'm going to give you a couple more cases on Thursday of logistic regression um, just to give you a, populate your mind with a few varied examples. So to remind you the relationship, um, if we count up exponential events, we can get a binomial. So let me go through that conceptual exercise for you now just to drive it home. So this is not a mystical thing. Uh, imagine we've got, say, like, you know, Fruit flies in a vial, or some, this is pretty macabre. Uh, uh, fruit flies in a vial, or it's graduate students finishing their qualifying exams. And we want to know, in a cohort of graduate students, um, uh, how many years it will take them to finish their qualifying exams. So we want to count up the number who will finish their qualifying exams in the first year, uh, which sounds unreasonable. Oh, sorry, the story didn't go so well. Uh, something <laughs> else. <laughs> and they're prelims in their first year. Some departments select prelims like mine, which is horrible and cruel. But, mm -hmm. um, so we're going to finish their prelims in their first year. Uh, so before we get to the gray area on this graph, and let's assume that the, it's an exponential distribution. It uh, works better with the fruit flies and vials, because fruit flies do die exponentially. They're like hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> they get bad fragments, <laughs> just like that. But um, So uh, we can say that each grad student completing their prelims is like a vertical bar on this graph, and there are 10 of them in this example. And uh, the ones that appear in the white region in the first year are successes. Um, the first term are successes. And then all the ones in gray are, are not counted as successes. Um, <laughs> sorry, that sounded bad. <laughs> Maybe I have to go back to fruit flies. Is that more <laughs> reassuring? Uh, uh, so as we change the exponential rate, so in the bottom graph I just added, the exponential distribution curves down faster because the rate of completion is faster. Um, and uh, this means you get, well, actually, it's exactly the same. Sorry, it's exactly the same. You were searching, like, are they different? <laughs> no, that's the next slide. So they're exactly the same. Across different cohorts of 10 individuals, sometimes there'll be four in the first term. Sometimes there'll be only two. It's going to vary because they're, they're random samples from the exponential distribution, 10 random samples from the exponential distribution. If we do this trial a bunch of times with a bunch of cohorts of 10, we'll get a bunch of counts, the counts that are in the white area. And if we plot up the distribution of those counts, you get uh, over, say, 10,000 uh, sets of 10, you get this distribution on the right. Um, and it turns out this is a binomial distribution. Uh, exactly. Uh, for all the maximum entropy reasons I tried to explain to you last week and earlier today, exactly why. It emerges naturally. There's nothing magic about it. The lambda here is the rate parameter in the uh, exponential distribution. That's what it is. Um, and it gives you a, a, a mean of a half. Um, and if you change the rate on this thing, so here's a, a process where they're, they're finishing slower, right? So the exponential is straighter, right? Uh, uh, the rate is lower. Then you're going to get a distribution that's piled up against zero because very often none of the fruit flies die in the first hour and none of the grad students finish their prelims in the first year. That would be sad. Um, so I have to write those prelims later this year, don't I? <laughs> uh, so um, if it happens really fast, then almost all the fruit flies most of the time are going to die in the first uh, hour. And 
uh, most of the grad students are going to finish their prelims in the first year. And instead, you get a binomial distribution that's piled up against the maximum. Uh, right? <laughs> Uh, does this make sense? Intu I'm trying to give you some intuition, connect it to natural processes. And sometimes if you get fancy, it's worth modeling this exponential process uh, underneath your binomial data because um, uh, there can be different censoring, right, about at the time in interval of observation, your counts are over different durations. We'll talk a little bit about that on Thursday. Um, so here's a yieldy binomial distribution. You're familiar with it, but I'm trying to give it some new paint here. Um, it models counts of a specific event out of n possible trials. So um, if there are 10 fruit flies or 10 grad students, anywhere between 0 and 10 could be observed to have the event happen to them right? in this interval. There can be more than two kinds of events, actually. It's just your categorization is only to count one of them. That's what it means. Lots of other things could be happening. Right? Uh, and uh, so we have the, our count, which is usually called successes, but I think that's a horrible term. Right? Uh, it depends on what you consider success. Fruit flies dying is not really a success for them. Right? Uh, number of trials in, uh, think of that as the number of coin flips or the number of marbles you pull out of the bag. And the probability of success P is what we're going to link our linear model to. Uh, Cody? Uh, you say a specific number of trials. So like, if you're thinking about like offspring had by month, is it okay to just put months in there? or? No, I would, that's... That's a hard problem, offspring, depends on which organism, yeah. right? It's humans, obviously, we know that at most it's one. Well, I guess two. Yeah, maybe three. Depends upon if you're on fertility drugs. Yeah, so. <laughs> but uh, there'd be lots of autocorrelation between months uh, in a human sample, so I'd want something else. Um, yeah, I'd want to know more about biology. I'd be nervous about that. Yeah. So there, there, there is, it is, in a sense, a very specific kind of trial. Yeah, be, it's just easier to talk about in an example. So, the, the, again, this is my horoscopic thing. I think it's very hard to, in general to say what these trials are or what the outcomes are until you get a data case. In a data context, it's, you can give precise and useful answers to these questions. Outside of it, it's horoscopes. Right? Your, your house is in Mercury and something, you know, it's an auspicious time to start a business partnership uh, sort of thing. Right? It sounds good, and that's the best I could do. Uh, anyway. Um, so uh, along those lines, important things to know about the binomial is the expected count is n times p, and the variance scales with the mean. So you don't have a separate parameter now for the variance around the mean. And this is a very important thing about count variables. All count distributions are like this. The variance inflates with the mean. And that's true in nature as well. The bigger the magnitude of a, of a count, the more uncertainty there is around the mean. And that's a normal thing about counts. Um, this is actually kind of embedded intuitively in the innate human counting system, which is logarithmic. So it seems that human kids uh, are born with logarithmic counting and it's present in all human languages, one few many. Right? That's logarithmic because it's magnitudes. And, uh, and pe people intuitively, even if they're not numerate beyond one few many, understand that many is vaguer than few and few is vaguer than one. <laughs> so the precision goes down as it goes up as well. Right? So that's all. Kids got that innately. And then the real number line is something you have to painfully force into someone's cortex right over time. The idea that you can take any number and add one and there's another number, that doesn't seem to be innate. But uh, that kind of precise counting system is harder to come by. But this logarithmic uh, scaling between mean and magnitude is, is intuitive for people. So I'm trying to extract the logarithmic part of your brain out of it here. One few many. Think of it that way. Um, and... Uh, Okay, so we use this to model counts of a specific event out of n uh, possibilities in trials. Um, the goal is to model the probability usually as a function of some predictor variables. When n equals 1, this is usually called logistic regression. Uh, although you'll hear uh, there's lots of slop about this, and sometimes it's just logistic regression just means you have a logit link. Uh, it could just mean that as well. Um, okay, so we're going to go through some examples. We're going to do a logistic regression example first where the outcome is 0, 1, and we use a logit link. Then we're going to do an aggregated binomial example. This will almost certainly be on Thursday, uh, where the outcomes are the counts over some larger number of trials. They've aggregated together a bunch of 0, 1 success trials. And you can do that, and that's fine, as long as the predictor values are always the same. It'll work fine. You can run the same model uh, uh, on these different forms of the data, and I'm going to show you that. Um, it's often quite convenient to do so. Um, uh, and along the way, I'm going to try to, uh, in the in the context of the data examples, teach you these important things about working with them. 
You've already heard about ceiling and floor effects. The other big one is relative and absolute effects. Um, that, uh, and I'll just punt on saying what that is until we get to the case where I can, I can show you how it manifests. Uh, okay, here's the data context we're going to work with. We're going to start this today. I've got 10 minutes to kind of explain the data situation, and then we'll work hard on this on Thursday and go through the code and how to make it work and interpret it. Um, this is a, a data from, uh, it's already in the rethinking package, from a set of behavioral experiments done with captive chimpanzees living in social groups, cases where all the chimps knew one another and hung out affiliatively. And uh, these are behavioral experiments meant to test how pro-social chimpanzees are in context in which people are extremely pro-social. Uh, people of a similarly uh, knit community, like, I can call you grad students. I can do this with you guys. You would always give more food to the other person. Uh, I bet. <laughs> and they probably give your own food to them, too. You guys are so good. But uh, so here's the setup. This is my cartoon on the left, which I was trying to do better than this. I don't know. Uh, all I got was the hair parting correct. correct. All, ch all, all champs have that hairstyle. Uh, it's, it's true. If you work with them, it's absolutely true. <laughs> and, uh, so here's the idea. You're looking at this table. You're, you're, the, you're a chimpanzee who's looking down this table. And that's your social partner on the other end. Um, in one of the conditions, there's a, another individual at the other end. In the other condition, there's not. Uh, so that's, there's a partner condition and a control condition where there's no other individual. You're just by yourself on the table. In both conditions, the table is set up the same. There are two levers that you can reach, one on the left and one on the right. If you pull these levers, it expands this accordion device in the middle of the table. You can see it in these photographs a little bit better. And there are two little dishes. And on one side of the table, there's food on your side and nothing on the other side. And on the other side, there's food in both dishes. So if you pull the right lever in this example, these two things expand out, and both individuals get a piece of food, right? grapes and things like that, healthy things. And um, if you pull the left lever, you get a piece of food, and the other individual is sad. Right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, so if you do this with people, in fact, really young kids, uh, they always pull the side of the table that gives food to both individuals. So there's no cost to you. right? There's no altruism. It's just concern for the other individual that's being tested. You're not giving up anything. We're just, paying, we're just measuring whether they're attending to the other individual at all. So we want to know if, when the other individual is present, the individual is more likely to pull the lever that has two pieces of food attached to it. That's what we're interested in. Um, so here's the verbal rundown of the experiment. There are two conditions, partner and alone. Two options, you can pull the pro-social lever or the asocial lever. The pro-social lever has two pieces of food, the asocial lever has one. Uh, and there are two outcomes. Then this is the outcome variable, left lever or right lever. We have a predictor for condition and option, right? A, con a predictor variable that tells us whether it's a partner situation or whether you're alone. And a predictor variable that tells us whether the left lever is pro-social or not. And then we predict the pulling of the left lever. That's the way the data is going to be coded. Does that make sense? And what we want to do is we predict outcome, whether they pull the left lever as a function of condition and which side the option is on. Uh, and this implies there's an interaction. Uh, we want to know if chimps prefer the left lever when the partner is present and prosocial is on the left. Right? So the effect of uh, the prosocial option on pulling that lever should depend upon whether another chimpanzee is present. Right? So that implies an interaction effect. Does that make sense? I'll show you the model in a second, um, and you'll see how this gets instantiated. So here's our model. Uh, this model addresses this question, do chimps prefer the left lever? When or how much do they pull the left lever? Let's model the probability of pulling the left lever when the partner is present and prosocial is on the left. And in fact, we want the interaction of the two, the dependency. So we can focus on um, the linear model line here. Uh, notice we've got our logit link, same thing as before. So what we're saying is, P sub i is the logistic of this linear model, right? Uh, we've got an intercept. Um, then we've, uh, P is whether the, the prosocial option is on the left or not, and that's our outcome variable, whether the left lever was actually pulled. Uh, and we multiply that, it's got a main effect, which is the uh, change in log odds of pulling the left um, when uh, the left lever has two pieces of food. And so why might they do that? They do that just purely because chimps like food. And when they see a side of the table with two pieces of food on it, they may pull that lever. And in fact, this is what's going to happen. Uh, just to give you some preview to this, chimps are attracted to big piles of food. Even if the experiment is set up so that they don't get the pile of food they point at, they will still can't stop themselves from pointing at the big pile of food. There's this hilarious video online, actually, where they set up the experiment that way. You train the chimps so that the 
plow through, they point out goes to the other individual, and they can't stop themselves from shooting at the big pile of food. <laughs> there, was, there was one chimpanzee who does it. As soon as she points at the big pile of food, she smacks herself. <laughs> and she just can't inhibit it. She's just like, no! <laughs> Right? It's like Homer Simpson and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, uh, so yeah, this is, why are you interested in this? Well, humans are pretty good at inhibition in that regard. I think it's one of the species differences. But uh, so we've got this, alpha is just the baseline handedness, right? That's sort of how much you like to pull the left lever regardless, right? It's just the intercept. Um, then uh, beta sub p is the change in log odds when the prosocial option is on the left. It could go up just because there's more food, and it will. Um, and then we've got some additional effect. Uh, when the other individual is present, um, when the partner is present, C for condition, uh, if there's some additional probability um, of pulling the left left of the prosocial side, right? And so it's in there. Notice there's no main effect of the other individual being present because there's no reason theoretically to expect that just because another individual is present, you will want to pull the left-hand lever, right? <laughs> so we don't put that term in the model. Uh, as an exercise for the student, after you've run through the examples this week, I encourage you to put that main effect in and see what its estimate is. Uh, just go ahead. But I, on theoretical basis, I suggest we shouldn't put it in the model, right? Because there's no reason to think that uh, the chimpanzee on the, on the lever-pulling side will want to pull the left lever just because another individual is present. Right? And I encourage you to analyze it, though, and see. All right. And then some weekly regularizing priors. Um, all right, so at the top, um, showing you how to fit uh, in map just the intercept only model uh, up top, just to show you a basic example. Um, these models are defined just the same way as before. I'm using map here, although map to stand looks the same, right? You just put to stand after the word map up top. And then the code does a bunch of extra stuff. But from your perspective, it's very similar. Um, and so you change D norm to D binome. The one is the number of trials, right? There's one lever pull on each row in the data set. Uh, the P, now you do logit of P, is your linear model. And there's one parameter in this model. Now there's no sigma because the, the mean in P determines both the mean and the variance of the binomial process. Um, that's the intercept model. Uh, two other models to show you the structure. Model 10.2 just has uh, the prosocial left option in there. So this is the model that asks the question, does does the chimp like to pull the lever that's attached to more food, whether or not they get it? The answer is yes, by the way. <laughs> they do. Um, and then 10.3 is the research question. The reason that the experiments were run is there an interaction of substance between uh, condition and uh, having the prosocial option on the left that results in more left lever pulls. Um, and then if there is, is it there for there to be more left lever pulling? It could be negative. So we've got to check. You can't just do the model comparison. We've got to check the parameter estimate. That's what we're going to do with that question. Wasn't that a case to you where the number of trials isn't one? Could we're going like to when you use the number of eggs or something, it could be like five or I don't know. Yeah, uh, yes, it could. Uh, the question was, um, when would the number of trials not be one? On Thursday, we're going to redo this example aggregated style. Okay. And then in will be 18, actually. And then after that, we're going to do a case where in varies row by row in the data because there are different numbers of trials in every row. Uh, and then I think, well, I, I will have populated your mind with every possible contingency. Uh, except, of course, the case, there are, there's a whole useful family of models um, uh, where n is what we're modeling. Uh, mark recapture analysis, which uh, the biologists here will have heard of. Uh, I love me some mark recapture. Uh, it's a great family of models and hugely useful in uh, applied conservation and game management. And, there, n is the population size, and what you're counting are like captures and deaths and recaptures and things, and n is the target of inference. You don't know it, but it turns out you can get a posterior distribution for it. Uh, we're not going to do that in this class, but I just want to say, sometimes what's data and what's a parameter depends upon what you have, right? That's one way to think about it. Um, okay, uh, so with that, I'm just going to put up the next slide so we can load a resume right here when you guys come back on Thursday. We're going to interpret this model, and I'm going to teach you how to plot the implied predictions from it, uh, do model comparison with it, and think through it. Uh, we're going to keep using all the same tools we've used so far. So in a sense, you're, you're learning just a few new things, linked functions and likelihoods. All the previous stuff still holds, but it's going to get trickier. Uh, so with that, I'll see you on Thursday.